Good morning, everyone. I um, have been at a couple of these conferences before, so I've, I'm trying to explore some new material. Hopefully it's not too repetitive, but realizing that maybe not everybody has seen some of this in the past, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a balancing act. Um, and I'm hoping that there will be time for questions at the end. So I know we're getting started a little past 10. Um, when or when can I just understand when I'm supposed to be wrapping up? Yeah. No, when am I supposed to be wrapping up? You've got 30 minutes. Okay, 30 minutes, great. Okay, wonderful. So um, as Bianca said, um, Evidence Action is really um, an organization that's about bridging the gap between evidence and implementation. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about why we're here today from the global poverty perspective in my, um, in my estimation. So just to say there's been tremendous strides in, toward poverty alleviation over the past 25 years. Billions of dollars have been spent in aid and international development. Yet we find that many of the poorest are still left behind. I just, I pulled some stats about world's population without safe water access and without safe sanitation. Pretty um, mind-blowing numbers if you think about it. What we do at Evidence Action is, rather than sort of the more traditional development paradigm, which is implementing a program and then trying to evaluate it afterwards and see whether it works, we flip that on its head. And really what we're doing is we're starting with the evidence, we're seeing where we can have the greatest bang for our buck, we're looking at cost effectiveness, I'll talk about that a little bit more, and then we're designing for impact. So that's what our programs are all about, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So again, Evidence Action really was created to bridge the gap between academic studies that evaluate what works to reduce poverty and implement, implementing those programs at scale. We don't want research to be left on the shelf. We want it to be able to impact the lives of actually millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, and that's why Evidence Action was founded. So what do we do specifically? We identify what those solutions are that have been rigorously evaluated, often through randomized control trials, but that's certainly not the only way that we do that. Uh, we design and test interventions to validate cost effectiveness at scale. So we're doing a lot of sort of micro programs um, at different levels of scale, trying to understand whether they work as we scale them up and whether there are things like unintended consequences, et cetera. I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And then we implement programs at scale to benefit hundreds of millions of people. Um, Deworm the World is a great example of that, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. So just a couple stats, so Evidence Action, our programs reach over 280 million people annually. Um, we have about 350 staff globally across 10 different countries which are on the map here um, Asia, in Asia and Africa. <clears throat> so a snapshot of our work, these are our three sort of primary um, tracks, if you will. One is Evidence Action Beta, which identifies promising evidence-based interventions and prototypes them, and pre pressure tests them, and gets them ready for scale. So that's what we call our beta pipeline, our beta incubator. We have Deworm the World, which is supporting governments to develop and implement large-scale deworming programs. We work in, um, we're helping to treat pr uh, children in five countries at the moment, and we're, we're trying to get started in a sixth one, which I'll talk about as well later, um, and really what the intent of deworming is, is to improve health and education at low cost. And then finally, our Dispensers for Safe Water program, which provides safe water through what we would call a proven, innovative, and low cost approach to increasing household chlorination, giving people access to chlorine at their point of water source, um, and it has adoption rates that are actually about five times as higher as other approaches, which means that a lot more people are actually using it and able to get clean water as a result. Um, we're reaching four million people with that program across rural um, areas of Kenya, Malawi, and Uganda at a cost of about $1.25 per person per year. So I thought I would talk, um, for those of you who saw me speak in Sydney last year, this, I, I presented this last year, but I do think it's actually quite uh, an, an important part of the work that we're doing on the beta side and this pipeline. Um, so you, you can see, you know, visually this is actually a bit of a funnel. Um, the funnel in actuality starts very, very wide and ends up very, very small at the bottom, but for purposes of depiction and getting all of that text in there, they needed to make it a little bit, looking a little bit different. 
But this is really um, a process that we are honing and refining constantly. Um, we have a new chief innovation officer who started at the beginning of, end of last year, beginning of this calendar year. Um, and she is working continuously on both the refinement of this and also looking for funding to try and build up our beta function more. Um, we need a lot of technical staff to be able to support doing this. We need economists. We need people who are um, experienced in cost-effectiveness analysis. We need a lot of research analysts to actually comb through all of the evidence and, under and to help us understand whether we think that something has been rigorously evaluated and whether it'll have impact. Um, so that requires a lot of sort of manpower on the thought process side, um, which is quite actually different than Deworm the World, which is much more field focused where people are on the ground working with governments or the dispensers program where we actually have, you know, guys on motorbikes um, driving around refilling chlorine dispensers all over the place. Um, so here what you can see is we start with, um, a, again, a very wide um, very wide t top of the funnel where we're sourcing lots of ideas. And we're considering hundreds of ideas per year. Those are coming from all sorts of different places. But we have relationships with JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab, which is based at MIT, um, Innovations for Poverty Action, which is where, oops, sorry, which is where Evidence Action grew out of. There's a lot of RCTs and a lot of other evidence coming out of those, um, of, of those organizations and other research institutions. So we're looking for as many different ideas across a wide variety of sectors. Then in phase two, what we're doing is taking a, a small number of those. So you can see going from hundreds per year to about 20 per year. And then we're actually trying to understand for those 20 or so, how would this work in practice? What would we actually be doing? And so some examples of some of the things we've been looking at are early childhood stimulations, uh, zinc and oral rehydration, rehydration solution, community harvest storage, a number of things. But again, not all of those are going to be things that we're actually going to want to take to the next level and then and actually pressure test and design those for scale. So we really then are coming down to about five and we're looking five per year and we're looking at those in a lot more depth. Those require sort of almost like and I, I hesitate to use the word pilot because, you know, that the concept of pilot, I think, in international development in particular is quite fraught. Um, but what we're looking to do is to really see how would we do this in practice on the ground in a real life, um, in a real life uh, you know, circumstance. And so one of the example of that is, for instance, our winning start program in Kenya, which is called G United, where we work with the government of Kenya to actually send volunteers out and help with the, that are remedial education assistants in classrooms, for instance. And we're testing that all the time. So trying to understand, does that work? And then the final phase is grow or test at scale. And so our No Lean Season program is a good example of that. Um, we've got um, that happening in, in Bangladesh and Indonesia. And then eventually, we hope that we'll transition about one program a year to scale. So you can imagine, this is an incredible amount of work to get there, and there isn't necessarily um, a lot of programs coming through, but the potential of each program that actually makes it through to the end, we then hope is going to be well positioned to reach tens of millions of people. Um, so here are just some questions we explore when we're thinking about um, evidence-backed ideas. Impact, cost effectiveness, and scale, those are the three pillars of the work that we do, and so we're thinking about what is the, the quality of the evidence? How can we measure impact? Um, is it something that we can understand through test it through this pressure testing process? Is this good value for money? Um, cost effectiveness, as I said. And then around scale is really about how are you going to do that? What is the delivery platform that you would use? Is there, if this is something that's going to require government engagement, is there a political appetite for an idea like this? Um, I won't go too much into no lean season, but uh, you know this is sort of what we're looking at in, in the testing at scale phase, which is a an intervention that resulted that that came out of um, a situation in places like Bangladesh where farmers during the lean season um, have 
greatly reduce incomes and food, con food expenditures and therefore consumption in their families. And what we're doing is providing small loans of about $20 to allow them to migrate seasonally um, into urban areas and get employment, short-term employment there. And what we found as a result of that is that it's increasing calories consumed per person per day. Um, so not just for that person, but actually that person is sending money back to their household that enables their children and their family not to go hungry during that, that lean season. Um, and so that program has actually was actually named to give well top charity uh, last year, even though um, it hasn't officially graduated to what we would call flagship status, but really based on evidence of effectiveness and, and cost effectiveness. So, uh, so in terms of bridging the gap between evidence and implementation, I, I, we spend a lot of time thinking about this um, and, and what, are we, what are we trying to do and how do we communicate that externally. So I'll be interested if there are questions at the end to think about this. Um, one is to say that we can't fear failure. Not everything will work. As you saw from that funnel, it's just not possible to do that. Um, and so we need to be risk takers um, and we need to be really calculated and critical, self-critical of the work that we're doing to really understand is this something that's going to have an impact. Second is to know your context. So we, and, and that means we need to understand both the causal mechanism. So why is this intervention that we think is going to work? Why is it working? Because we can't, we won't be able to necessarily replicate it in a different context or outside of a very tightly constro controlled study environment if we don't have an understanding of that causal mechanism. So we're thinking a lot about that. And then the context in which that'll be implemented. So that might mean, you know, if you need government um, buy into your program, how do you do that? Who are you talking to? Who are the players that are involved? So there's a lot of sort of this policy um, piece of this as well. And then um, keep improving. So we're always thinking about increasing scale, even in our flagship programs. How do we increase scale and make sure that this particular intervention reaches more people? How do we continue to improve cost effectiveness? Um, and then how do we continue to monitor key outcomes to make sure that the interventions that we're supporting have that real life impact. So I think one of our current challenges, at least on this bridging the gap and, and really the, the beta stuff, is securing funding for the process of identifying and scaling up opportunities um, because it is, as I said, so risky and you're not necessarily very easily in a position where you can say, to a donor, well, if you put in this much money, you're going to get this outcome, which is very clear from the deworming perspective from dispensers what, what somebody's money is able to do. It's a lot fuzzier with beta, but we're thinking really about it that this is a big bet. Um, and I think with you know, sort of the, the venture philanthropy and a lot of things that are um, becoming more mainstream, we're hoping to be able to, to bring donors along and really get them to, to buy into that process and to understand why it is inherently risky, but that the, the payoff really could be quite um, tremendous at the end. I'm going to skip that um, because I have limited time. Um, with deworming, I'm happy to, to talk to people more about deworming because I, I don't have a lot of time left. Um, but really, again, evidence scale and cost effectiveness, deworming hits all three. Um, we're now uh, treating over 270 million children um, annually through the Deworm the World initiative. This is not us that's actually doing the treatment. It is the government. It is teachers in schools who are doing this. We provide technical assistance to governments to get this uh, to happen. Um, and so we, we work, um, as I mentioned before, we're treating in five countries currently, and uh, Pakistan is the newest place where we're looking um, to work. Um, I wanted to show this, um, this little image, which it's only, it only does it once, and then I have to flip back and forth. But one of the things that's really exciting from my perspective is that we recently um, finished five years of the Kenya school-based, national school-based deworming programming. And the, the program has been rigorously monitored throughout by uh, part of the sort of a, a, a satellite of the Ministry of Health in Kenya. And what we've seen is a tremendous reduction in worm prevalence and worm intensity as a result of five years of treatment. And so you can see here, um, this is, there's both pre-deworming and post-deworming because they take different measurements, but effectively 
um, what we're seeing is a, is a really significant reduction in worm infection. We know that the program is working, um, and we know that it hasn't gone far enough yet, and so we really do need to continue to um, help support deworming in Kenya, which we, are, uh, which we are doing currently. But I think this is one of the first times that we've been able to see the impact of the work over several years because, again, we haven't been working um, in many countries all that, all that long to be able to have that level of impact assessment. So that's something we're looking forward to. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of data on cost per child. It varies tremendously. I'm not going to go into that in great detail, uh, but happy to take questions about that if that's helpful. Um, one of the things, as I mentioned, we're always trying to do is, is get greater cost effectiveness, and so we regularly every year do a very intensive costing of all of our programs to really understand what the costs are, what the cost drivers are, how do we decrease that um, in the future. A lot of it has to do with scale of the program in India, in Bihar, which is the top one. If you're reaching 50 million kids, it's a lot cheaper than if you're reaching um, 3 million. It's just, <laughs> it's just economies of scale. Um, so that's, that has a lot to do with it. Um, one of the other things we've been thinking a lot about is how to improve coverage of hard-to-reach children, so kids who are often not enrolled in school. Um, how do you, using a school-based platform, get them uh, to come to schools to be treated? And so we've been actually testing out a few different <clears throat> a few different ways to do that. Um, some, of, some of that requires just identifying them and being able to really specifically pinpoint them. Some of it, as in Nigeria, um, getting Muslim leaders to buy into the program and make sure that they're uh, sensitizing their particular communities is really helpful to get those kids to go to schools. Um, we've set up mobile deworming camps for, um, you know, for particular subpopulations as well. Um, so, in terms of expansion of, of deworming, um, so two of the places where we're really looking at still is Nigeria. We're working in four states, but we're also um, supporting the National Health Ministry to develop an STH and schistosomiasis action plan. So these two parasitic worm infections, hoping that that will help them to really get a more comprehensive program in place because the treatment has actually been quite low so far. Um, and then in Pakistan, so in, um, we conducted um, what we call an STH prevalence survey to understand what the bur worm burden was um, in Pakistan. It turns out that there's actually quite, a, quite um, a number of children who we had sort of thought might need to be treated and they don't, which is great news. It's still 17 million in Pakistan. And so right now we're, um, we're working on advocating with the government to make sure that we can get programs up and running. Um, Islamabad capital territory, this is this... Um, pictured is our uh, my colleague Badar, who's um, based in Islamabad. He's been having regular meetings with um, Ministry of Health, Education, um, planning and development officials to get that program off the ground. There's a lot of enthusiasm and support, so we're quite excited about that and hoping that we can get um, at least some treatments out toward the end of this year, depending on when the drugs arrive in country. Um, so just a couple last things. I hope I have a couple more minutes. Um, in terms of the future of deworming, one of the things that we've been doing and that I thought might be interesting for people to see is looking at really what's the gap, what's the gap left in treatment globally. Um, and we've been um, doing an analysis of this. So you can see this the, in the, the pink bars, are, this is all data coming from World Health Organization. Um, and as of 2016, which is the most year, recent year for which there's data, 64% of children were being treated. The, the goal is to reach 75% by 2020. That's the WHO stated goal. Um, so we can see that what that effectively means is that preschool children, there's still about 130 million who need treatment, not receiving it, and about 173, this is all, you know, give or take, um, school-aged children. And so... What we've been trying to understand is where are, the, where are the biggest gaps? Are there places where the school-based platform may make sense? In a lot of cases, it won't. Um, conflict states typically don't, or are fragile states. Typically, school-based programs are not a good idea. If you've got low school enrollment, there's no point in creating a school-based program because the kids aren't there. Um, so there are other ways to do that, and, and other organizations that work it more in those types of states that could be more well-suited to, to start programs in those places. 
Um, but so what we've been trying to do is understand, are there places where school-based deworming could be more helpful? And then what would the investment be needed? Because I think one of the things that, that I feel in particular is we need to re-energize the, um, the funding pool for deworming programs. Um, I, I, a few key donors have left. They're not interested in it anymore, or their interests have morphed in different ways for lots of different reasons. Um, and the stated goal, I think, by the WHO and others is that, well, all of these countries can just pick up the tab for these programs. If they could do that, they would be. They don't have the money in most cases. Um, ministries of Health are incredibly overstretched. They can barely pay the salaries of the people on staff um, and pay for the regular maintenance of their buildings, their clinics and things, let alone discretion, what, would they, what would effectively is discretionary spending for other programs. And frankly, worms are a lot less um, urgent than things like HIV AIDS um, and other sort of big, uh, big time diseases that are, that are really sort of the main focus. So trying to understand what that investment is that's required and how can we mobilize donors and countries as well, you know, to, to bring them together to think a little bit more about that. Um, and then here I just listed a couple challenges and opportunities that we're thinking about um, and happy to talk more about this if there's time for questions. How can we use the school-based platform to layer other interventions cost-effectively? So iron and folic acid is a great example of that. The government of India has asked us to help support that program, so we're looking into how we might be able to do that. Um, sustainability of programs over time, what does that look like, um, both from an implementation perspective and from a financing perspective? Um, how do you ensure continued impact? Um, is there are there things that we can transition over to the government, and how do we um, how do we do that responsibly and effectively? Um, that gets to the same point as well around exit strategy. That sort of has to do with us, um, our exit strategy. Um, uh, the delivery platform it, is the school-based platform sufficient for all the things we need it to be for, or are there? Um, other sort of modifications that we would recommend to help uh, to help improve that, and then finally, um, there's a big sort of play at the moment in um, in many I, I think for many in this space around uh, whether you can eliminate STH entirely, uh, effectively eradicate the disease. There are some uh, mathematical models that say you can. Um, there's a lot of people who work in this um, space and have worked in this space for many years um, who say it's just not going to be feasible unless you have Im significant improvements in water and sanitation. In fact, hookworm um, was supposedly eradicated from the U.S. back in the uh, 19th century, early 20th century. It's back. Um, there's a lot of places in Alabama at the moment with open sewage and they're finding hookworm there. So you can't really get rid of this disease um, and these worms too easily. And so I think my concern there is just making sure that we're continuing to focus on, an, on making sure that the kids who need treatment get treated so that, um, and, and not to put that at risk for, for the purposes of sort of a broader um, quote unquote elimination strategy that may not be feasible. So I think that's it for me for now. Um, I hope that was helpful. And again, I'm happy to take questions um, now or after the break. Thanks. Thank you so much.